Hey guys, Charai5 here, and uh, I don't have a reaction for you guys this time around. This time around, I have an analysis for the TGS Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer in 2018. Uh, Square Enix just dropped a new trailer last night, which was apparently supposed to be an extended version of the Big Hero 6 trailer that we got, like, last week. Um, and I didn't do a reaction to it because I figured, well, if it's just going to be an extended trailer, we're going to get a few new story things, but that's about it. It's going to be mostly the same trailer because... Uh, that's kind of happened in the past, but I kind of regret it because this is a completely this is this feels like a completely new trailer. Like uh, so many new things in this TGS trailer, uh, the Tokyo Game Show for 2018. Um, it was kind of late last night when they revealed it, uh, and since then I was writing the script with a friend of mine. Uh, we were both noticing things. Uh, stuff that I didn't notice she pointed out so she absolutely helped me write this script and I just wanted to there was just so much information in this trailer that I, some of it might be obvious but other uh, other information is more speculation based and I think I kind of want to touch that uh, with you guys so uh, we start out with the trailer what we see right away is uh, during the checkmate scene we see different uh, chess pieces um, that which we've noticed we've noticed in the past we we've seen that you know young Xehanort and young Ericus are, are playing chess and we've seen that the chess pieces are you know reflecting the characters in the Kingdom Hearts series but they give us a clearer shot of what the pieces are and every chess piece has a different like sigil on top um, and in the in the frame we can see uh, what seems to be Saix, uh Vanitas, Marluxia, Larxene, young Xehanort and some Seeker of Darkness, what I think might be Aqua, I'm not sure what this sigil is, I th I personally think it's Aqua, but it might be like an unversed symbol, which I think is kind of strange considering that we already have one that's kind of clearly Vanitas, so I think like having two different ones would be kind of strange, so I kind of think it's Aqua, and then we have a chest piece that looks kind of like two cubes, but we'll get, that, we'll get to that in a minute, I don't want to touch on that just yet, uh, but in the middle of all this is what seems to be Ericus's last chess piece, which has a crown on top. And in the background, we can see that, like, there are a bunch of other, uh, you know, chess pieces belonging to Ericus that are already out of the game. Um, and I think that this final chess piece might be Sora. Uh, just because the crown has always been associated with him, it might be King Mickey, but I don't... I honestly don't think that's the case. I think it just might be Sora. Um, after that, young Xehanort puts down a piece that... Uh, I'm thinking might be Master Xehan, or like, I, I'm i still not entirely sure, like, I kind of thought that it would be more of a heart-shaped sort of piece, um, I think this is like the safest bet, I'm thinking it is Master Xehanort, but I guess we'll see. After that, we see that Erica says, my move, isn't it? And I think that maybe means something similar to what he said, uh, or something similar to what Terra said in uh, Birth by Sleep, which is that he said he had something up his sleeve. I think uh, Xehanort said that to Ericus. He said, oh, Ericus always having, like, tricks up your sleeve or something like that. And, um, I think maybe this might be indicative of, like, him helping out Sora in the end. Like, it might be, uh, sort of a, a callback to that, and, and it's, it's hinting at something later on. Um, and I think this is further supported by Sora finding Ericus's keyblade at Destiny Islands, which, you know, we see later on in the trailer. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, but then... It, after that, it immediately we sh we were shown the text, and then we move on to the Big Hero Six portion of the trailer, which is actually new. Like it's not what we saw last time, because in the last trailer we saw um, Sora, Donald, and Goofy meet up with Hero, Hero, and Baymax at uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. But now we see that they're more in like this. We're they're more in the city part of San Francisco. And we see that Sora not only has, like, new gear, but he has, like, a Baymax kind of style Keyblade. Meaning that either Hito made it for him, or this is a revisit to this world, which I think could be actually kind of cool. Um, Baymax remains to be the only party member that we see, meaning that the actual Big Hero 6 might not be joining, it's only Baymax, which, I mean, that kind of sucks, but that that's, that's still cool that we get to you know, have Baymax, I mean, Baymax is pretty much the, the main mascot of that, of that movie, so it's cool that he's the character out of all of them. Um, then we see the reboot of Superman 64 with the ring mini game, uh, while Sora isn't holding a Keyblade. We don't, I don't really know what these mini games are for, but we're gonna see a whole lot of them later on. Um, and <laughs> it's just him going, like, through rings, we see, like, a score and everything, and I don't know what the purpose of it is, but I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll find out, and I'm sure that they 
have a pretty big purpose in like if not in the story in the game itself which i think is really cool um i think the last time we saw something like that was it was probably birth by sleep where we saw like this amount of mini games and that was only in like disney town uh but anyway uh, this was something i noticed immediately the next scene is them all eating ice cream on top of a big structure. In this case, it's the Golden Gate Bridge of, you know, all goddamn things. Also, we only see Hiro, Gogo, and Baymax uh, are with Sora. No, you know, none of the other big Hero 6. No Donald, no Goofy. And I think, like, this is this is to perfectly represent Hainer, Pence, Olette, and Roxas, you know, during their time eating ice cream on top of the clock tower. Uh, as we can see, Baymax isn't eating, you know, due to the fact that there's a lack of chocolate on his hands and face, you know. Baymax, I guess, just doesn't like fun. But Hiro talks about Tadashi being inside of Baymax, and as such, inside of all of his friends. Reflecting how Roxas is inside Sora, and so inside everyone else. Now, this was something I actually noticed right away, and I even said it while, while I was watching the trailer. I'm like, oh, okay, Th this is like, this is the way they're bridging Big Hero 6 with, with Kingdom Hearts. And it's like, oh, it's supposed to reflect... Um, Roxas and Hainer Pence and Oled and all that, and then like almost immediately after I say that, they change the scene to the literal the literal interpretation of the subject matter, and and Sora says that maybe it's so that he can be strong when no one else can be, and I think that this is also is it's hinting at the kind of role Roxas is going to have in the story. Maybe when all hope is lost or like when you know someone falls, Roxas swoops in to save the day. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but this is the first time we actually see Roxas in any of the Kingdom Hearts 3 trailers, which is awesome. Uh, right after that, we see Riku and Mickey at the Dark Margin talking, and Mickey mentions that Riku has finally found the strength to protect the things that matter. Mirroring not only the quiz in the first game, you know, where the one where, like, you're, you're given, like, the three questions to determine uh, how you're going to level up in the game, there's a, there's a question there that asks you, I think, like, what's the most important thing to you? And I think, like, one of the answers is, like, my friends or something like that. But not only does it mirror that, it also mirrors the quiz in Dream Drop Distance, where Shion asks him when... I think it's Shion. It might be, I might be wrong. But one of the three characters asks Riku um, the, a very similar question, like, what's the most important thing to you uh, in order for Riku to collect Ansem's data from within Sora? And w one of the answers, I believe, is the strength to protect the things that matter. And I, I just think that it's cool that they're making a callback to, to something that we thought was kind of like a small thing that didn't really matter. Um, in the very next scene, we see that Sora gets the new iPhone X or whatever it is and gets a call from Supple Boy, Ienzo. And they look disappointed that it's not their home slice, Riku. Like, all, all three of our, of our main people are disappointed because I guess it's been a while since they've had contact with him. Then again, what else is goddamn new? But they're, I guess they're waiting for a call from Riku, which means that Riku must also have an iPhone X. Um, you know, they put, a, they put a deposit on it, you know, they had to take out another loan from the bank. Uh, all that money that they spent on Apple. Uh, but also, Supple Boy's screen is like 200 by 200 pixels, so like, it's just really weird, because it, it, it always looked like a Discord call to me, which is really strange. But then like, it's, it's a box, it's like a square of a screen. Despite the whole screen being a rectangle, it's like, what kind of phone is Yenzo using that it just like the rest of the screen isn't being used? Uh, also, it, it's worth noting that I don't think Yenzo and Sora have ever spoken before, meaning that at some point, um, Sora, Donald, and Goofy have to return to Radiant Garden and meet up with him. Uh, maybe it's Yenzo himself who gives him the communicator, uh... And if that's the case, if they're expecting a call from, from Riku, that means that they all together go back to, to Radiant Gardens and meet up with Yenzo and whoever is at the castle at the time as well. Um, we move on to see something that I didn't think we would see, which is, um, you know, more of the, of the Disney worlds. Uh, I knew that we were going to see Big Hero 6, but I didn't think that we'd be seeing any of the other ones. And if we did, we'd see, like, little snippets, but we actually got quite some information. We got Rap uh, we got Rapunzel uh, being excited to see something outside of her tower. She's like, oh, it's fluffy. What is this? She goes in um, to touch it, and like she's kind of excited like in the movie. And when she touches it, it reveals the Heartless. And I'm, what I'm guessing is that this is the first time that they encounter the Heartless in Corona. 
Um, and something that my friend brought up was actually that these might have something to do with Mother Gothel, who we still haven't seen as a villain yet. Um, and maybe, you know, like how in the previous Kingdom Hearts games, like, despite the fact that the Heartless and, and the villains have really nothing to do with each other, uh, they always have something to do with each other. Like, it's always the villains controlling the Heartless or something like that, especially in the first game. I'm thinking that maybe this is a similar case. Um, where, where Mother Gothel is kind of controlling those Heartless and is impeding Rapunzel from, like, going out, uh, into the kingdom. Um, but even though we haven't seen her as a villain, someone we do see is Davy Jones from Pirates 3, making his debut as a villain in Port Royal. Uh, he, he oh my god, I can't gush enough about how good... Port Royal looks. There are a lot of tentacles in <laughs> in Port Royal. Much many tentacles ensue. Uh, there's not a whole lot. We just see Davy Jones talking to, to Jack Sparrow, who like I think mimics what Davy Jones is saying before running away in a very you know um, a, a very Jack Sparrow like manner. You know, it's very very close to his original character. After that, we see uh, Sora talking to Anna while on their way to find Elsa. They're just sitting there and looking out on the horizon. And Sora tells her that she's the only one that would be able to reach her. I think that's maybe a reflection of, you know, Sora's own experience uh, when trying to reach Riku after they went on a similar, like, journey where Riku kind of got mad and, you know, he, he went away causing, you know, some trouble and, and Sora went after him. And, and I think Sora's maybe talking from experience to Anna, you know, trying to comfort her. Um... After that, we see Sora on Destiny Islands again, mirroring the very first trailer for the game we got back in 2013. That was five years ago. And we're finally seeing now the connection between Sora going to Destiny Islands and, and picking up that Keyblade. Now, something I didn't know, and I'm actually going to check it out right now, is whether or not he has his Kingdom Hearts 2 attire, because I don't think he did. Yeah, no, Sora has his Kingdom Hearts 3 attire in this trailer. So... Already, that's kind of changing from what we were initially uh, shown because in in the very first trailer, Sora still has his Kingdom Hearts two outfit. So they've updated that to now be his Kingdom Hearts three one. Um, and I, I don't know how this is displaced. I don't know what like exactly what goes on there. Uh, Goofy says some shit about guiding hearts or whatever, and Sora's like, "Okay, I believe you." Basically, it's Goofy telling Sora that if he found this Keyblade you know, that's that's a good sign, and it means that someone is telling him that he's on the right path. And this is what I was talking about earlier with, the, you know, Ericus maybe helping Sora indirectly, even though these two have never met before and probably never will meet. It, it's, I think it's a good sign of, like, the past influencing the future. Now, how this Keyblade gets here, I have no idea, uh, but we'll get that, we'll get to that in just a sec, because remember that Aqua had the Keyblade in 0 0.2. So after that, we again see Luxord in Port Royal pondering what's in the box. Um, you know, the box from Kingdom Hearts Keep Back cover that we still have, like, no idea what it is. The Master of Masters gave it to Lushu to, like, take somewhere. But, you know, people have actually speculated that it might have a heart, like either the Master of Masters' heart or Xehanort's heart or whomever. Uh, we know that Maleficent and Pete are looking for it as well as we saw in another trailer, but we still don't know how they found out about it or why they want it. I think that's that's an interesting thing. I'd, and I want to know... Ex what I love about these trailers is that they're not giving away too much. They're always revealing new information, uh, but still, like, talking about previous information that we got without telling us everything. You know, like, we know that, um... We know that Luxord is looking for the box. We don't know if... I'm sure the organization itself is looking for the box, but we don't know what's in it. We know that Maleficent and Pete are looking for the box. As usual, Maleficent and Pete and the organization have very similar um, goals, but, like, they never really coincide with each other. So I guess we'll, we'll see that in... in I hope when the game releases, not in another trailer, because I, I do want surprises still. Uh, after that, we go back to uh, Arendelle. Sora calls Lark Seedhound on her shit, of saying that they can't have found the 13 Nights of Bad, to which Bug Lady over here says, hell yeah, we have. And then Sora, Donald, and Goofy are like, what? And, and then we find out that it's kind of true, because holy fuck, there are more than 13 possible members, and we see most of them in this trailer. Um, so obviously we have Master Xehanort, who, of course, he has to be, like, the leader of the organization, because why not? Young Xehanort, which we've seen in other trailers, but we haven't seen in this one. Uh, he started out in, in Dream Drop Distance. We know about, uh, his involvement. We know that he's 
helping Master Xehanort out a lot in terms of the time travel mechanics and, you know, bringing everyone else back. Xemnas and Ansem obviously have to be part of the true organization as well, being, you know, uh, Xehanort's Heartless and Nobody, respectively. We have Zigbar, who is pretty much Xehanort's right-hand man, so of course he'd, you know, he'd obviously play along with Xehanort's schemes. Uh, Syx, who we also saw in Dream Drop Distance, who, you know, we were all kind of surprised to see, especially, like, Lee was surprised to see him. Um, and we catch a glimpse of him in this trailer, too. We don't really see a whole lot of him, and I, I kind of want to get into that a little bit later. Vanitas, whose face we haven't seen yet. We've only seen, you know, his, his, uh, helmet in this in these trailers, uh, but I think it's safe to say he is going to be a Xehanort as well because he's always had yellow eyes, much like Xehanort. Uh, Marluxia, who in the very first trailer had blue eyes, but then was revealed to have yellow eyes, uh, so I'm assuming he's going to be uh, an organization member as well. Larxene um, has always been shown with yellow eyes, even though I think originally she had blue eyes, uh, and I'm, I think it's safe to say she's part of the true organization as well because she's talking a lot about darkness and about the organization she's the one that tells Sora like yeah we already found our 13 like we don't have to worry about that uh look sword as well I think he also he also has colored eyes um and we've seen them be yellow like in the very first pirate pirates trailer we saw look sword again um and he's had yellow eyes since then aqua was like a huge reveal in one of the past trailers like the fact that she has like white hair and yellow eyes now which I think is like kind of indicative of her being like way Zaya Norted at this point because Larxene, Marluxia, like a lot of these characters still have like their colored hair, you know, but Aqua doesn't have her signature blue hair anymore. She has like very distinct grayish hair, which, you know, kind of scary. Uh, there's a Riku that we see in this trailer that I'm going to get into in just a bit. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about who I think this Riku is, because uh, this is also kind of a big reveal for this trailer. Uh, and two more kind of big reveals in this trailer as well are Vexen and Demix, who... You know, Demix is another character that we don't know a whole lot about. We don't know about his involvement in why he was part of the uh, original organization. Vexen was a scientist for Radiant Gardens, and it makes sense that he was part of the original organization. But now we kind of see he's also part of the true organization, but we'll get into that in just a bit. I know I'm saying that a lot, but, you know, in due time. This is a three-minute trailer, but it felt like six minutes. Um... We have a family photo. Uh, we we have two different photos of Twilight Town. One with Data Twilight Town with Roxas and Hainer Pence and Olette, and one without Roxas in the photo. But it's practically the same one. It's just you know it's framed a little differently. My my friend actually uh, asked who took that photo, and I think I might have asked that before myself. I'm not entirely sure, but that is a good question. Like I don't know who took this photo. Maybe it was it was a timed photo. Like they they set a timer on it and then it took the photo. I'm not sure. But we also have Hainer telling Sora that they'll help find Roxas, even if it means heading into the Data Twilight Town. And we see them, like, standing outside of the uh, castle outside of Twilight Town, where, you know, in Kingdom Hearts 2, you could access Data Twilight Town and real Twilight Town. Uh, back in Port Royal, because we keep, like, jumping back and forth between Kingdom Hearts and the Disney Worlds, we see a really, really cool battle between our ship and another ship. Uh, it, it looks super intense. I think Sora's the one, like, actually... Uh, steering the ship and just the, the way that we interact with the waves and and like the the, the health of our own ship uh, mixed with the speed of our own ship it's kind of like a mini game within like an important part of the game uh, like I don't know we suddenly fight the Kraken otherwise known as Japan's ultimate fetch the ultimate tentacle monster which I think is also really cool that we're going to be fighting like a kind of iconic thing in in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies um, Sora is rocking that pirate outfit, fighting alongside Jack Sparrow again in a place I honestly at first thought was Corona again, but kind of with like muted colors. And I think I thought this because the flower nobodies were there that we saw in like some of the very first trailers that we didn't really know like what those were. Um, so we see those here in Port Royal as well. And that, that kind of threw me off, but like it's, it's clearly the pirates world and it's looking great, I gotta say. Also, we summon Cthulhu and beat the shit out of the surrounding Heartless Nobody, so that's that's really cool. Like, I, we get to see another one of those, like, Keyblade summons, or, uh, like, Keyblade abilities. That, that, that's really cool. Again, we return to Mount Olympus, more specifically Thebes, where we get to see that Trinities are a thing again by stealing the mechanic of Breath of the Wild with the Trinity Sled, crashing into, the, like, the little flan Heartless, with the, which, by the presence of a score, looks to be, like, another minigame. And, uh, you know... 
minigames seem to be kind of prevalent in this trailer since we see Sora taking selfies with his enemies a little shit, stealing mechanics from Dead Rising because, you know, you can actually get scored on your photos now. Like, you, you take a snapshot and it says, like, excellent. And I, I absolutely love <laughs> the fact that, uh, you know, that this is becoming a meme. I think it's absolutely amazing. We, I had a lot of fun with my friend last night just making different ones, and you can, you can check those out on my Twitter. Um, so many things that, like, the key keepers have been posting. Just uh, so many people have been posting, like, these kinds of memes. Um, and and you, this is a very similar mechanic to, like, other games. You know, like, you can... You, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see Sora, like, running around Alola taking photos of his favorite Pokemon or something. And, and Final Fantasy XV actually did a very similar thing with, like, taking photos and stuff. Uh, I think someone even made, like, a Prompto and Sora, like, selfie. That, was, that one really made me laugh. Uh, in the very next shot, we see that Sora's fighting a really big doggo. You know, he's not, not, not much of a good boy because he's so heckin' big. Uh, he's most likely a boss because he has, like, a really large health bar. It's, like, really... It's, it's, it's like, boss long, you know? Like, where there are seven different stages of that boss meter. And what, I'm, what I think is super curious is that Marshmallow from Frozen is in our party. You know that, that big snowman thing that Elsa makes to protect her castle? He too is heckin' large, but it allows us to have a big boy fight, which is really, really cool. And also, something I noticed is that Sora has the Toy Story Keyblade, hinting at the fact that we visit that world first, or again, this is like a revisit. But what strikes me as weird is that we're blowing up a large ball of ice, which is too big to be the Puppo, so it must be something else. Maybe something Elsa herself created, I'm not sure. After that, um, we have not only the reveal of more lyrics to Don't Think Twice, but we also see Not Not Xehanort and Zigbar, Xehanort's personal ball licker, are discussing whether or not one of the vessels will stray from the given path. Zigbar replies by saying that if that happens, they'll have to find another vessel, while panning over to Sora, Donald, Goofy, Hainer, and Oled, meaning they're probably talking about Roxas, but more on that later. We move on to a pretty big reveal as we see two returning members. Now, here's where we get back to Vexen and Demix, who are seen talking to each other. But the thing is, we never really see Demix's face in this scene, only his backside. But we can clearly see that Vexen's eyes are now yellow, as opposed to their natural green, meaning that he must also be a Xehanort. Vexen says something about it being his idea, playing the damn pronoun game, you know, leaving us pondering who and what they're referring to. But I think this struck me as odd because we know a little bit about Vexen, but we practically know nothing about Demix and his past. This is the first trailer where we're seeing either character, and they're characters that we wanted to see for a while. We honestly thought that we wouldn't get to see them at all. Um, but here they are, and they're, they're having this kind of conversation, which I absolutely love. I, I love that they're bringing back these, like, kind of intrapersonal uh, character conversations and cutscenes because it, it really gives life to this world and to these characters. Um, after this, we, we jump right into another scene where we see and confirm people's suspicions that either Recuplica or Data Riku have returned as a Xehanort, evidenced by his yellow eyes. Now we can see that Sora is wearing his Big Hero 6 gear along with his Baymax Keyblade, meaning that this must be San Francisco at night. Uh, now, onto which Riku I think this is, I personally believe this is Data Riku, much to my distaste of Recoded for a number of reasons, but uh, the first reason I think this is probably Data Riku is because he looks like a younger version of Riku, and we can clearly see that he has much longer hair than our normal Riku, who, as we can see, has, you know, his hair cut now, it's not like the Kingdom Hearts 2 length, it's, it's now, you know, his, his haircut that a lot of people like, um, and, and it's more... This, the Riku that we see confronting Sora is more akin to his design of the first game. Uh, beyond that, remember how in the very first scene of the trailer we saw a chess piece that looked kind of like cubes? What other cube-like object have we seen in this series before? Hmm. Oh, I know, the blocks from Recoded. You know, like, I think that's probably what that chess piece represents. I think th there are two, like, blocks on that chess piece, and I think that's to sort of, like, uh, represent that they are the like the bug blocks uh, mostly because one cube would kind of be strange and it, there are no indents on it or anything so I think that may be what it's representing not to mention Recoded is one of the only times we've ever seen young Riku wear the organization coat outside the ending of Chain of Memories um, Riku not only mentions that they're always trying to one up each other which is something Data Riku would know but Recuplica would care more about like, that, that, I think that's kind of what throws me off. 
But since Vexen is apparently around again, this could be Recuplica 2.0, which is a mesh of OG Recuplica and Data Riku, like in concept, like bringing both these um, instances of Riku together, but in a completely, it could be like a completely new being in, in practice, maybe even using Shion as a base, given that her purpose was to be a puppet with Sora's powers, and she too was based on the original Recuplica. Now, another reason I think it might be Data Riku is just like the whole concept of data and corruption and a virus and the Big Hero 6 world, which is also kind of like in that technology with the microbots and like with Hero's microbots and and um, like Data Riku's bug blocks, I think that that would be very, that would be a really cool fight to see personally. I think like um, they, they, can, they went for sort of a theme there. Uh, so that also kind of leads me to think it might be Data Riku. In the next scene, we see Vanitas and Ventus, who is still asleep for some goddamn reason. Wake up, kid, it's been over ten years, in what seems to be the land of departure, meaning that Vanitas has, must have found Ventus and reinstated Castle Oblivion into the land of departure. He calls him brother and questions what he's going to do with him. I'm assuming this has to do with the fact that Ventus' heart is still asleep and still inside Sora, so he can't really do anything with him right now. He just can watch him sleep, pretty much. We again see poor Aquanord at the Dark Margin wielding that weird Keyblade which looks like a fusion of the King Key and Star Seeker, which I gotta say is actually pretty cool. Personally, I like the design. Uh, however, she's really pissed off and she wants to take out that pain on, well, I can only assume Riku since Mickey's a little bitch who got trapped as we saw in the last trailer. Uh, the very next scene is huge, like Honka but Donk Long Honka does huge. Since we see Donald, Sora, and Mickey of all characters, not, not Goofy, but Mickey, facing Master Xehanort in what appears to be the Keyblade Graveyard. It's also worth mentioning that this is the first time we're hearing Master Xehanort in the game since Chi Kaotsuka's passing in 2015, voiced by who I can only assume is Kotaro Nakamura, who has taken over the role of Dr. Eggman in the Sonic the Hedgehog series. I say this because Otsuka sounded practically the same as both these characters, and this portrayal of Xehanort sounds incredibly close to Otsuka's voice. However, reports also state that Chikao's son, Akio Otsuka, who is better known as Solid Snake, has taken over his father's role, which would be amazing if that's true. I, that would be, like, actually awesome, because he sounds so close to him. And, and Akio actually has, like, a way deeper voice than, than his father. Like, uh, Chikao had, like, a very, like, raspy kind of voice, which is what we hear in this trailer as Xehanort. Uh, so if Akio is able to actually pull off his father's voice, that, that would be amazing. Whoever has taken over the role is doing a fantastic job, though. Like, it, whether it be one, whether it be the other, they're doing a great job as Xehanort. I, it, it really makes me curious, and I can't wait to hear who's filling Leonard Nimoy's shoes in the English role, because that is, those are some pretty big shoes to fit in, both in Japanese and in English, but the Japanese sounds amazing. Uh, we cut to see a normal Aqua apparently fighting Ansem's bodyguard Heartless and getting caught by the ankle getting swung. Now this is something I didn't really notice at first uh, when I first watched this trailer, but upon seeing it again and like seeing it frame by frame, I kind of deduce that it's either before she gets norted or is indicative of something else at play. Like I don't, I don't know if her getting norted is an actual thing. I don't know if like this this takes place before then, if this is the process of her falling to darkness. I'm not sure. But something else to note is that she's no longer uh, wielding Erica's Keyblade, which uh, she had in 0 0.2. Like back to, back to Erica's Keyblade and back to, uh, you know, why it's strange that Sora has it on Destiny Islands. Uh, I think that at this point, the Keyblade is already on Destiny Islands, uh, probably already picked up by Sora, because she's she's not holding it, she's not using it to fight, she's just like flipping around and she's not like trying to fight back at all. Um, but I guess we'll only see like then what happens to her, and I mean it makes sense that she would get norted because after that, she wouldn't have a weapon because her Keyblade is back in the Light Realm in Radiant Gardens. Um, no, in the world that never was. Uh, whatever. Uh, either way, Xemnas, I think, is the one that has it. <laughs> um, like, they, they have her, her Keyblade Warrior armor. And she don't, she no longer has a Keyblade because the only other one she had was Ericus's. Uh, we see in the next scene that Kyrie and Lee are talking to each other, which really doesn't 
tell us a whole lot other than the fact that their bond is growing. And we see that Kyrie's pointing her finger at her head the way Lee always does when he says, gotta memorize. So I'm, I'm thinking that that's what she's saying to him like in return. And she's using like the got it memorized against him, which then leads into Demick. Like we, we have like a, a bunch of like small little scenes here that leads into Demick's using a dark portal to arrive at the lab in Radiant Gardens, confronting Ienzo, but also carrying another scientist. Also worth mentioning is that we still don't see Demix's eyes. They're closed in this part, even though we can see his face. And we can't see who it is he's carrying, but we might have an idea of who it is. The most obvious answer obviously would be like Evan, Vex and somebody, but it raises more questions since we've seen Vexen already, unless he's leaving with Evan so to turn him into a Xehanort. The, the thing about that is, like, it looks like he walks forward, not back. So it, it, it kind of makes it a little confusing there. We don't really know a lot of people with the scientist guards. Evan and Ienzo are like the two main characters that are like, oh, they were the scientists, you know, because uh, original Xehanort, or like Terranort, I guess, also kind of was a scientist and Ansem the Wise was kind of a scientist, but I don't think it's either one of them because they're not really around anymore. Um, we see in the next scene after that that Ienzo has his head hanging low and Luxord is grabbing his shoulder, not in a really menacing way. It, it actually kind of looks more like he's trying to comfort Ienzo, if anything. Again, this kind of raises the question about what kind of relationship Ienzo and Luxord have. Okay, so this is me uh, in the process of editing this video and I actually just noticed something. Um, I went back and looked at Luxord's facial hair um, and it doesn't really look like this person's facial hair at all. In fact, if you look at Luxord's nose, it doesn't really match up either. But there's only one other character with a beard that I know that's blonde, and that's Ansem the Wise. Now, it also makes sense that Ansem the Wise would be wearing not only the organization coat, but would be comforting Ienzo. So I think they just teased Ansem the Wise with this trailer. That's that's interesting. I didn't even think of that. If Yenzo's even in danger, is Yenzo a threat? Yenzo kind of seems to have a big role in the trailer. Uh, for a split second, we see... Back to Sykes, we actually see him approaching Lee on the clock tower in Twilight Town. Very similar to how Roxas, Axel, and Shion would approach each other in 358, with Lee having a very shocked expression. Now, mind you, we still haven't seen Sykes' face in... Kingdom Hearts 3. Like, there are a lot of characters who, like, they're not showing us their face yet uh, or their eyes, and eyes are, like, they truly are the window of the soul in, in these uh, in these trailers. Uh, and maybe this could mean Syx is Isa again? Like, that, that would be pretty cool. I doubt it, but it would be cool. Like, Lee is still wearing his coat, despite no longer being an organization member, so maybe the same could be true for a childhood friend. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, we catch a mere glimpse. I'm talking, like, half a second of, of Terranor. Yeah, the Terra, the Terra with the white hair. We see, like, we don't even get to see his face. Again, like, we just see, like, his mouth and his hand, like, he's grabbing his head like he, he's in pain or something. Uh, but there is another interesting thing here. We, if we observe the background, he doesn't seem to be in a dark place, meaning he's probably not in the realm of darkness anymore. But where could this be? I mean, it's not, there's not a whole lot to go off of, but the background sort of looks like rock to me. And the only place I can think of would be the Keyblade Graveyard. After that, we see Benitas holding his Keyblade above Aqua's body. And maybe this is him turning her to darkness? I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm actually kind of thrown off because, again, this is the Land of Departure, not the Realm of Darkness or Castle Oblivion. And not only that, but... It also seems like he's going to take her heart or something, maybe even time travel being a factor, because there's this ominous energy in front of them that I can't really make out. It's, it's really weird. Uh, we see the cock tease that we got from 0 0.2, or Zora, or <laughs> Zora. Sora reaches out for Aqua, followed by Sora falling into a dive into the heart, which clearly belongs to Ventus, as evidenced not only by his Keyblade, but by the Wayfinders that Aqua made him birth by sleep. Maybe this is Sora finally waking Ventus up. Following that, we see that Sora and Kairi are on Destiny Islands during a sunset, sitting on that tree, very similar to how they were in the first game and the intro to Kingdom Hearts 2. However, we don't see Riku with them this time. We, after that, we see Lee crying, talking about something most likely to Kairi, uh, and we can tell that this isn't Destiny Islands, mostly due to the fact that there's grass there, and while there is some vegetation on Destiny Islands, uh, we've never really seen it like this, despite the fact that this also play takes place during a sunset, you know, the, the Destiny Island segments and the, um, 
this segment with Lee are very similar in terms of its color. It, like you can tell that they're both during a sunset. But I, if anything, I say that this place probably takes place outside of Yen Sid's tower. We've seen Kyrie and Lee in a place that's kind of obviously not, <laughs> you know, Destiny Island. So that's that's probably where they are, like right after Dream Drop Distance or something. Um, the trailer ends, however, with Roxas dual-wielding what I can only assume is Oathkeeper and what is very obviously Oblivion, one of my favorite Keyblades, as he takes off his hood. Where he is, though, is a bit of a mystery to me because I, it doesn't look like a place that we've seen before. It looks like a Keyblade, but despite that, you know, like, despite the fact that we've never seen it before, I know I've seen this place. Like, it's, it's one or the other, like, either we've never seen it or it's, like, a new version of a place we've seen before. It kind of looks like the Keyblade Graveyard, you know, with all, like, with the sort of stone kind of aesthetic and the dust. But it's more brown than it is orange. Like, the Keyblade Graveyard, the Keyblade Graveyard has more of an orange tint to it. And, but aside from that, we've never really seen a building there, and it looks too bright to be Twilight Town. Like, Twilight Town looks more like it's, it's, Twilight Town is always, you know, during Twilight. It's always like a sunset or it's always the dawn, whatever. What I was thinking was maybe this was Daybreak Town, and I didn't really think that because my friend mentioned that, and I was like, yeah, it, maybe it is Daybreak Town. And I, and I asked people on Twitter, and, and they sort of agreed, mostly, that it might be Daybreak Town. I'm still not sure. Uh, the thing is, when comparing windowsills, they don't really match up. But I know I've seen these windowsills before. I know I have. Whatever the case, we know it's a place from the past due to how old it seems to be, aside from how dusty it is. Now, something worth mentioning is that this is the first trailer where we even see Roxas. I know I mentioned this before, but it's exciting to see him wielding a Keyblade again, too, even. Maybe Organization 13 wants Sora to awaken Roxas? Like, because we, we remember that we saw Xemnas telling Sora how he could awaken Roxas. So maybe they want that to happen, maybe to make him a vessel, regarding Ansem and Zigbar's conversation. But again, Lee is wearing the coat and isn't a member anymore. So a coat isn't inherently indicative of, you know, an organization member. Because we've seen, like, other characters have the coat before. We've seen Mickey wear the coat, we've seen Riku wear the coat. And that doesn't mean that they're organization members. It just means that, like, they're protecting themselves from the, you know, the dark magic or something like that. Um, what strikes me is that there are so many potential candidates now. Like, but before we struggled with even figuring out who could be a part of the organization, now there are like too many characters that we don't really know exactly who's a traitor, exactly who's in the organization. Maybe it's not even Organization 13 anymore. Maybe it's something more. Uh, and heck, we see Ansem's bodyguard, Heartless, and we don't even see Xemnas at all. Like, there's, there are some characters that we don't even see in this trailer. Uh, I found it odd that we didn't see Xemnas, uh, Marluxia, and technically we didn't see young Xehanort either. We saw young Xehanort, but playing chess with Ericus. We didn't actually see, like, organization young Xehanort, uh, who, is, who actually kind of looks different from the Xehanort we see playing chess with, with Ericus. Um, but yeah, like, it, it's weird that we see some characters and we don't see others. The fact that these three characters were absent from this trailer struck me as kind of odd, certainly. Uh, we are drawing ever closer to the release date of the game, but there is one more thing I'd like to bring attention to. Along with the trailer, we did get the reveal of what apparently will be the box art for the game, this beautiful illustration of all the protagonists we've seen thus far. And honestly, I think a lot of symbolism goes into this illustration, as we see most of the characters bundled in trios. Sora, Kairi, and Riku, Ventus, Terra, and Aqua, Shio, and Roxas, Axel, and Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, along with Namine being left to the side, particularly under Roxas, and I don't think, that the, I don't think that's a mistake or a coincidence. Uh, Mickey is on a ledge above Goofy and Donald, which I, I might be reading too much into it, but I, I really do think that it's representing how Mickey, as the king, is above the others in terms of a hierarchy, and also how disconnected from Donald and Goofy he is, because despite the fact that they're always talking about him being their best friend, I think we've seen him with Aqua more than we've seen him with Donald or Goofy. Speaking of people Mickey hangs out with more, notice how he's almost right above Riku, and right below Riku, Aqua. So I, th I think that there, there is sort of a, like, um, coming together, like, if you look at them from top to bottom, it's Mickey, Riku, and Aqua, I mean, like, people that that Mickey's hung out with more than Donald and Goofy. Um, 
I really, really don't think that this is a coincidence. Add it to that, despite the fact that most of the characters here are Keyblade wielders, only four of them have their Keyblades out. Sora, Kairi, Riku, and Mickey. And what piques my interest is that this art has amazing attention to detail, since that's clearly the Keyblade Kairi uses in Kingdom Hearts 2, and we see that Riku has his car key Keyblade behind Kairi and right next to Sora's foot. And I bring these up because if anything, they'd be easy things to mess up. You know, Kairi hasn't really been seen with a Keyblade often, and this Keyblade is new for Riku. Easier still would be to mess up Sora's Keyblade, which has been sort of a series icon since the beginning, but as we can see, Sora's Kingdom Key doesn't quite look right. You know, the blade itself looks golden, kind of like the Kingdom Key of Darkness, but the handle remains gold as well. You know, the, the Kingdom Key D has a silver, handle, not a gold one, but like this one looks gold almost all throughout. And I bring this up because one would expect Mickey's Keyblade to be the Kingdom Key D, but his seems to be that new Star Seeker Kingdom Key, which is, I, I don't know, that's really weird. Maybe Sora's Keyblade is reflecting the sunset, but I feel like that it's just too yellow to just be reflecting it. I, I don't know, it's just something I noticed. Um, something that I kind of realized while looking at this was that it, it was very similar to the to the box art for the original Kingdom Hearts 1, uh, where we see Sora, Kairi, and Riku, and Donald and Goofy, like, in that very night sort of sky. And this is a lot prettier. It's like sunset, night, galaxy, day. Like, it, it's, it, it, like, it brings everything together. Um, and I think on a final note to end on, something that I noticed, <laughs> which took me a little bit, it took me a little bit to notice, but I noticed that there were 13 characters on the bot on the illustration. Um, which I think, it, again, it's no coincidence that that's the case. Like, these these 13 characters have been practically our protagonists, our good guys, um, and they've been with us almost throughout the entire series. So, um, I just wanted to give my two cents on what I thought about the trailer. Uh, I wanted to analyze it a bit because I thought it was super, super interesting. And I want to know your thoughts. Who do you think are the true organization members? Uh, did you notice something that maybe I didn't notice? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. So uh, until next time, guys, I can't wait to see the new trailer. Apparently there's something going on on the 23rd where they're going to talk about the world that are going to be in the game. Maybe we'll get a new reveal. Maybe that's all the world we're going to get. I don't know. Uh, but I'll talk to you guys then. Until next time, guys, this is Charai5 signing off.